Hello, everyone. This is Mark Leslie Lefebvre from draft to digital I'm here with the draft to digital spotlight. And I am honored to have my good friend Terry Fallis here. Terry, welcome. Mark, nice to be here. Thanks for thinking of me. Well, I was thinking about you because uh, it's a funny story uh, because you are a humorist. But I was thinking about how we met. And it was the early days of indie publishing and self-publishing. And I was a traditional bookseller uh, working at McMaster University Bookstore. You were a graduate from the engineering uh, 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 department there. And you had reached out because you had uh, self-published a book. And back in those days, there was a stigma against self-publishing. I had, uh, having been in the book industry almost 20 years at that point, um, I kind of had my nose out of joint because I'd seen some really crappily produced books that were slapped together, maybe right. put in a duotang and like, hey, could you sell my book? And and you reached out and you were very nice. And uh, in, in your message, uh, you left me voicemail, but then you'd also, because you're very persistent. I love that about you. <laughs> but um, I got the message and then uh, an email from you. And, uh, and I saw you had a podcast of your novel, The Best Laid Plans. And uh, just for any viewers, this was the original version of The Best Laid Plans. And I thought, well, I love podcasts. I listened to a lot of podcasts. This is back in 2007. And so I started listening to it. Now, I, I worked at McMaster. I had a long walk across campus. Uh, it was almost a longer walk across campus than it would have been to walk to the campus for, for my drive to get to the parking lot. Right. And I remember listening to it and thinking two things. Two of my favorite writers, um, John Irving and Robertson Davies, uh, particularly the humor stuff. And, and, and he, does, he has done some humor, high spirits, uh, Christmas uh, ghost stories. Um, yep. And I remember thinking, oh, my goodness. This guy is good, and he reminds me of these two. So uh, wow, that's honored. when I, I thought oh, maybe I should call him back and have him come in and do a book signing. So, so you wrote this novel, which again, and let's be honest, you picked the topic a humorous, <laughs> a humoristic look at Canadian politics, satirical. Yeah, a satirical novel of Canadian politics, which is the clearest evidence that I didn't know what I was doing if I wanted <laughs> to be published. Because it's really not the topic one would choose if you really wanted to get a foothold in the publishing world in, in Canada, let alone any, in any other country. Uh, <laughs> but I just thought I should write about what I knew about. Uh, and I just naively went on my way and, and wrote that novel. But, but that but was you a knew, big moment. You knew about politics, right? Uh, you had well, worked. yeah. I, yeah. I worked on Parliament Hill. I, that's how I earned my living in the early part of my career. I worked uh, in the back rooms. Uh, political advisor to cabinet ministers and and then for a year in opposition in Ottawa before I came back to Queen's Park because I was born and raised in Toronto and uh, I was a political advisor to the finance minister for two and a half years in the uh, the Peterson government. So I, I knew about politics, I felt strongly about it and I was not that happy with how we were practicing politics as a country regardless of uh, of the party. So I decided to, uh, rather than writing a, a rage-filled non-fiction polemic on my <laughs> views on the state of politics that nobody would ever have read, I decided to cloak my ideas in a funny story and put my thoughts in the minds and mouths of some characters you might come to, to like and, and even care about by the end. And that's really where the best laid plans came from, the, the story of an accidental member of parliament. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, as you might expect, for writing a satirical novel of Canadian politics, uh, I was greeted with a deafening silence by the traditional publishing <laughs> world after I sent out all of my query letters and plot synopses and sample chapters. And uh, I really only got one email response. And it was from Beverly Slopen, a literary, a literary agent who said, I've read the novel, it's very good, it's funny, and but you've written a satirical novel of Canadian politics, what were you thinking? <laughs> and she said, I, I can't possibly find a home for this, but but thanks for sending it and good luck. And and I, you know, I, I, I did a good thing then, I kept that email and that helped me later on in the process. <laughs> <laughs> so you couldn't find a publisher, um, a for this topic, for this this yes. hard hitting topic, um, <laughs> you uh, you published it yourself. You put everything together. 
I did. Um, yeah, I I decided I to self publish it. My wife actually suggested it. I didn't know much about self publishing, but it was in the early days of print on demand. So okay. uh, I I'd crossed that Rubicon. I was no longer part of that era where you had to order 10,000 copies to have them molder on a skid in your basement. Uh, <laughs> it was all print on demand and it was reasonable. Uh, financially, it wasn't that onerous. And uh, But I re recognized that I was not gonna have a marketing team behind me promoting it and getting it in bookstores. So I needed to spread the word. And that's when I, you know, months before it came out, in in hard copy, six months before it came out, I guess, uh, even more, I started the podcast in January 2007. I decided to podcast the entire novel chapter by chapter and give that audio version away for free uh, in the hopes of building some kind of a, of a listenership who might then decide if they didn't buy the book for themselves, because uh, they just listened to it for free, they might have enjoyed it enough that they'd buy a copy for their, uh, you know, mother, brother, sister-in-law, neighbor, worst enemy, whatever it might be. Uh, and that's, you know, that was the the whole theory that you know you give it away for free in one format in the hopes that it comes back to you uh, in in a different format uh, with a few dollars. <clears throat> So one of the things I do know is that um, you had a background in both PR as well as in producing audio because you yes. already had a professional podcast that you were part of. That's right. Yeah, I uh, back in 2006, April 2006, uh, a colleague, I'm, I'm in the PR agency world and a colleague and I uh, decided we would start a podcast about public relations, about our day job. And we called it Inside PR, and it started uh, spring of 2006. Um, and so I knew how to edit, how to produce, how to upload, how to how to do all of that, uh, and how to get reasonable sound quality and add some music and that sort of thing. And that's it was that experience. Expertise is a strong term, but experience, that's what I uh, deployed when it came time to podcast uh, the novel, uh, you know, eight months later. And then one of the things I'm, I'm probably getting ahead uh, ahead of the, of the curve, but w when you started working with a major publisher, they actually used your version of the books because this is a practice you continued with your other novels. They actually used your version of of the books rather than hiring a, a voice actor as, as i understand it right well it's not that would have been great it wasn't quite like that what they did is they just there was no audio book for my first six novels because i can i sought their permission to continue to podcast the novel and produce it myself uh and continue to give it away for free uh, in a way, as a as a tribute to the loyalty of my podcast listeners, because I'm I'm totally convinced that without the positive feedback I got from podcast listeners around the world, that I wouldn't have pushed the big red button and <laughs> ultimately self published uh, right. the novel. But because uh, you know, contrary to popular belief, and many people confuse this, they say you must have felt so confident about your story to keep going. And it's actually quite the opposite. I podcast it to find out whether I had written a novel. Uh, <laughs> because I didn't, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't believe the positive feedback I was getting from my brother and my sister-in-law and my wife. They're the only ones who had read it because they loved me. <laughs> uh, Never going to lie nicely to you, right? <laughs> right. So I, I still didn't really know. But when a listener who I don't know from Kuala Lumpur and Scotland and Australia and France, when they all email me and say, this, you know, this is great. And how come we have to wait a week before the next chapter is uploaded? <laughs> uh, it began to feel like maybe I actually had written a novel. So it wasn't my confidence. In fact, it was my lack of confidence. Uh, I, I needed other people to tell me that, okay, you've actually written a novel and, and it holds together and I enjoyed it. So that's what the podcast was all about. So in 
to, to pay those uh, listeners back for that, I continued to offer the podcast for free and produce it myself for the first six novels. I finally sold out with my current novel, Albatross, because Penguin Random House, uh, McClellan and Stewart, now has their own audio division and they uh -huh. produce their own audio books. And when they did that and asked me if we could do the audio book, I said, great. So I still got to, to, to do the, the narration. So I'm, I'm the voice on the audio book for better or worse, but you actually have to pay for the audio book now. <laughs> oh, and it's, and it was well worth it. I've been a long time fan. Um, I, I buy every one of your books in print because I want to have a copy. I mean, I have many signed copies because I have to have that nice trophy in my right. house here. <laughs> it makes really good acoustics for the background. But um, I love listening to your versions of them. So I was so glad uh, that Albatross, I'm more than happy to, to pay for that uh, and listen to that. I was so happy you did it. But one of the things that you had done, I don't think it was with Albatross, but with the previous ones when it was being released serialized over 36 weeks, is you would start about a month before the release day. Because what I, I mean, and, and a lot of people probably just rushed out on the day it came out or ordered it and had it delivered because <laughs> they they didn't want to wait right. <laughs> eight, eight or 10 or 12 more weeks to get to the end of the book. They just wanted to binge it right away. Well, that was the, the, the one concession I made to the publishing world, my, my publisher, is that uh, they agreed to let me podcast it, but they didn't want the podcast to finish before the novel was was released. So yeah, we always staggered it so that uh, I, there were still you know eight or nine chapters to go or something when the book was uh, released. Uh, but that right. was fun. But you know, it took a lot of time, and I actually I miss it sometimes uh, doing the podcast, but not that often. <laughs> now with the last book, were you in a studio or did you, cause yeah. I know you, you did it from the original ones from your home office, right? I did it from this very room where I'm sitting now. Wow. Um, this awesome. is where it was done. Uh, yeah, I would put my laptop up on a low shelf over on the other side of the room here. And, and, uh, I would just, you know, I had a nice radio style condenser mic that went into a nice digital recorder and it all sounded uh, pretty good. I would put plugs in the air vents here to, <laughs> so that uh, the sound of the furnace coming on would not uh, be heard. Um, but, uh, but, it, but it was, uh, it was a great experience, but producing it took a long time, as you know, cause you do your own production. It took, you know, I used audacity the same way I think you do Mark. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, it would for a, a half hour long chapter would probably take me maybe three, three and a half hours in total to produce right. a half hour of uh, reasonably good sounding audio. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the other thing um, I want to get to is, so you had self published this book, then right. you uh, won uh, a major humor award, the Stephen Leacock Medal for Humor. So then, uh, which was the very first self-published book to ever do that. I think at that point, uh, Bev, your agent, was able to find a publisher. Um, right. Although she wasn't my she wasn't my agent until it was shortlisted for the Leacock. Oh, I see. Okay. Then she said, hey, let's sign this now. Right. That, that's what prompted. I, I emailed her after the uh, the announcement of the shortlist. And I I just I had to remind her. I said, I, here's the email trail. Um I just, this has just happened. Does this change anything? And I wasn't being snide about it. I was genuinely curious as to whether or not being shortlisted for a, a major literary award uh, might cause her to reconsider having me join her stable of authors. And she said, let's, uh, let's have a drink. And we met and I you know, we got on very well. She's a lovely, lovely person and a very good uh, agent. And uh, and she took me on, promising me I was not going to win the Leacock Medal um, because it was, you know, it, which was good advice on her part to keep me grounded, uh, but also reasonable, uh, a reasonable supposition that I would not win. Right. Uh, and then somehow, miraculously, my name was uttered uh, as the winner. And that's when my life really changed as a as a writer. We signed with McClellan and Stewart uh, a week later. Excellent, and then the and book I've was been re there ever since. Yeah, the book was re-released re um, about four months later, I guess. And I've been with them through with all for all 
uh, well, I was going to say s seven of my novels. Uh, number eight is I'm working on now. So I have, and, and I have a number nine coming with them as well at some point in the future. Neither they know, nor I know what that novel is yet, but we will at one point. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So the best laid plans, uh, Angus, fish out of water, uh, ends up uh, in, in politics, not we're not really caring or wanting to be in politics. He finds himself right. backed into that corner, which is part of your humor is that fish out of water, you know, uh, which is very funny. Uh, then you wrote the sequel to that, The High Road, um, and you're returning to write about Angus uh, again in this in the new novel you're working on right now, as I understand it. Yes, I, I, I didn't know that I was ever going to return to Angus and... Uh, and Daniel, the two sort of lead characters in those first two novels. Uh, but uh, I have to say, having done almost a thousand book talks in the last 10 or 11 years or so, 12 years, I guess, the single most common question I get is, will there be another Angus novel? Right. And often, they often say something like this. They say, I've read all of your novels and I like them all, but nothing will beat the first one, which is not always <laughs> what an author wants to hear. Right? I've just gone downhill for eight books, but, uh, uh, but clearly uh, Angus uh, struck a chord with, uh, with many of the people who've been kind enough to read my novels. And uh, I thought it was time that I came back to Angus, uh, maybe for the last time, but you know, never say never. Uh, so yes, Angus and Daniel are back, and it won't. This new novel, tentatively entitled Operation Angus, uh, is not going to be quite as rooted in politics as the first two. Right. Uh, maybe I learned that that may not be such a, a a good idea. But he is a cabinet minister in this novel. But he and Daniel stumble into, uh, call it an assassination plot. <laughs> uh, against a world leader, uh, and it's do it's not the Prime Minister of Canada, and it's not the President of the United States. It's somebody else of that order, uh, and it's set to happen in Ottawa. Uh, so, and Angus and Daniel cannot get anyone to believe them that this is happening, and end up kind of uh, having to freelance it uh, <laughs> until the very end when they finally get some help. But uh, Anyway, I hope it's going to be fun. I'm, I've been uh, writing, you know, almost all weekend, every weekend, the last uh, several weeks, and I'm, you know, I'm about thirty-five thousand words in uh, of the probably ninety-five thousand words, maybe maybe ninety thousand words. So I'm getting there. I'm I'm crossed the I've crossed the third barrier. I'm one third in at least. Excellent, excellent. Now, the the other thing about Angus and Daniel is uh, you've had the honor of winning a uh, major uh, literary award. Also, CBC Canada Reads uh, named uh, the best laid plans the best novel of the decade, um, which was great. Which was like a, a debate. Well, it's yeah, it's kind of a. I mean, it's sort of a ridiculous, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, thing to to call it. Whatever novel or, or book had won Canada Reads that year was to be designated the essential Canadian novel of the decade. So it it's you know it's it's more about Canada Reads than it is about the novel itself. Stop, but uh, stop poo pooing yourself. Yes, that's true. <laughs> but but it, anyway, I, I'm always yeah. careful not to uh yeah, drink I, I my that. own bath water and all that stuff. <laughs> I get that. But the other thing that not a lot of authors have had the experience of is you got to see that novel be adapted for a CBC television miniseries, right? And then what was that, eight episodes? It was uh, six episodes. Six episodes. Yeah, a six-part. What was that like uh, as a writer? Well, that that whole experience. It was. Uh, I I really enjoyed it, and I went in with the right perspective because I'd spoken to enough people, uh, and you know you shouldn't expect to see your story in its uh, in all of its perfect detail presented on the screen. That almost never happens when novels are adapted for uh, the big screen or the small screen. Even when you have six episodes, six hours worth to do it, the novel, there's too much story in the novel. Right. Uh, so they end up paring down the story, simplifying it, fewer characters, uh, and stuff gets changed. Uh, and so I get a, had a lot of uh, 
lovers of the book who said they, you know, they may not, they didn't really love the series as much because so much was missing. And that's just the reality of, of going to TV. Right. And authors who end up getting so mad about that at the end probably shouldn't have taken the, uh, the money <laughs> you know, for, for the film rights because that, it's inevitable. Right. They have the story and they own the rights to the story now, so they can do what they want. Now, I was quite happy with, with the, the story. I thought while it, the story departed from the novel, I thought it captured the major themes I was trying to deal with. Uh, right. The characters were, were pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> and there was enough. There was uh, flatulence in the TV series, <laughs> <just> like <laughs> in the, the novel. <laughs> Occasionally. Um, yeah. And it, you know, some of the, the dialogue was lifted right from the novel. So, and, you know, I'm never going to complain about somebody producing uh, a six part miniseries of, uh, about my novel. I mean, I'm just, I'm just not going to. So uh, I loved it. Uh, and we were very close to the same group of people doing no relation as a, as a, as a feature film. No. Uh, oh my God. I love that. Well, we I mean, were close, but we didn't yeah. make it. We didn't oh, make okay. it. So, wow. uh, but you know, one day, one day maybe, but that was a great experience. And then uh, if that wasn't enough, this is the novel that keeps on giving it. It was actually developed and produced and staged as a stage musical as well in, uh, in Vancouver. Wow. So, and I got to go out and, and I workshop some of the songs with them and, and then see the, the the two week long run. I saw the first five or six uh, times they performed it, uh, and it was a uh, it was a great just a great experience. So oh, yeah. I amazing, yeah. Feel like I have exhausted my lifetime allocation of good fortune when that where that novel is concerned. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to uh, pop up a comment. We're going to be taking questions uh, in another 10 minutes, but I had to pop up this comment from Carol. Carol says, love that you're returning to Angus and uh, Ottawa, but have to say love Albatross, which was your most recent release too. Right. Bought all your books for my dad. And when he passed away, I got them all back. So many, I have two copies. Carol, that sounds like an amazing collection. That's so, Carol, thank you. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's lovely to hear. Uh, and it's always nice that uh, I, I've been really lucky because a certain number of readers always seem to think my current novel is is their favorite. And yeah. that's always nice. Uh, that offsets all the others who say the best laid plans is my favorite. <laughs> and, and I don't begrudge that at all either. Uh, they are all my children. <laughs> of course, you love them all in different ways. Well, exactly. I mean, well, I, 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 Albatross was the last one I read. And I think maybe the last book of yours I've picked up and read, even if it was the first one rereading again, is always my favorite because right. there's so much to love. There's a couple things. I, I mentioned the fish out of water, which is really important. So you've got the the senior going into space. You've got um, the writer named Hemingway who can't write. Uh, you've got um, Albatross, which is a guy who wants to be a writer, but he's a pro golfer. And again, you made me read about, so golf is one of the most boring things I can imagine. So is Canadian <laughs> right. politics. And yet I loved and adored both those topics. But right. the thing you did really, really well, there's a really great novel that um, is a feminist novel, basically, uh, where you explore feminism and that's pulls apart. Right. And I think there's something you do. You did this in the best laid plans. You make me laugh and then you make me cry and you make me think and then you make me laugh. And then you, you're constantly doing that. What place, uh, so with a serious topic, like obviously politics are very serious now in this divisive world we're in, or, right. you know, feminist, um, women's rights, women's issues are all, always, you know, very serious, um, but right. you manage to apply humor. What's the, what's the value or the importance of humor in such serious topics? Well, to me, humor can be a very trenchant instrument of social comment. Uh, and on for most social issues, we rely on the tried and the true, the protest rally, the anger, the clenched fist, the chanting. Uh, and those have all been, been great tools, but sometimes uh, the audience we're trying to reach, which are those who haven't thought about these issues before and don't know how they feel about some of them, sometimes they get turned off by the, the the pumping placard and the uh and the anger through the megaphone and i often think that humor can be a really interesting way to get 
people, the great majority who haven't formed opinions on some of these issues, to think about these issues and draw their own conclusions. Uh, so to me, humor gives them a different entry point to uh, a social issue. Uh, so uh, to me, I've never thought that that funny novels are necessarily less serious than uh, the novels that aren't funny. They're just serious in a different way. Uh, I hope they still get you to think about things. And in almost all of my novels, I hope there's an underlying message. There's a mission I have. And in Pulls Apart, it was, yeah, to advance the cause of, uh, of women's equality. It's been an issue of interest to me since I was active in the student movement back in the uh, early 1980s. And uh, in fact, some of the experiences in Poles Apart have their roots in my own experiences in the women's movement. Um, so it, that was a book that is perhaps closest to my, my heart in a way because uh, the issue was, is so important uh, to me. And it took me five, it was my fifth novel. So it, I had to get four out of the way before I could figure out how to how as a white male who hails from the most privileged demographic in the history of human civilization, how could I, uh, you know, write a book, write a novel about feminism uh, in a way that, you know, that worked and didn't offend anybody. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, it, it took me a while to figure it out. And, and I hope I, I hope I did, but, uh, but, you know, to your point, Humor gives us a different way to think about important issues that are worthy of our thought, demand our thought, and deserve our thought. And it's interesting. I'm only thinking about this now, but when I reflect back, as you talked about uh, women's rights uh, being an important thing that you wanted to to uh, share and talk about, um, that uh, Marin, um, Angus's wife, is very heavily involved, right? Yeah. Yeah. In She's a... Yeah. yeah, she's a, she's a, an accomplished and celebrated feminist theorist, writer, and and academic. Now, she's off stage the entire novel because she dies six months before the novel opens. That first right. novel, uh, but we learn about Marin through Angus's diary yeah. entries that close uh, each chapter in those Which, first two th novels. Those bring me to tears uh, mm -hmm. just thinking about them. So <laughs> excuse me, I'm going to have to go off camera. But no, <laughs> it's really beautiful, uh, touching, uh, yeah, as he's writing to his wife. Right. And that's uh, probably the most uh, rewarding and fulfilling experience I've had as a writer. Beyond the simple uh, act of being introduced as a writer, which is always really satisfying. But on, I think, maybe half a dozen occasions at, in various places across the country after I've done readings, uh, an older man or an older woman, it's happened with both, have come up to me and said that, uh, you know, their, their spouse had passed away in the last year and they couldn't figure out how to go on. And they thought reading those diary entries that, that Angus makes perfectly captured what they were feeling. And then they would start to cry and then I would start to cry and we would hug and I said, wow, if, if, if no one reads another word I write, I will feel like I've, uh, uh, I've been blessed as a writer. Oh, that is fantastic. Thank you. I, I, I moved to tears. I'm not supposed to be touching my face at this time. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. I'm going to jump into a question that popped up uh, since we're getting close to that time. Uh, this is from Jamie. Jamie says, uh, I have a YouTube channel with one video. I'm laughing out loud. Do you think making YouTube videos about writing or just about books or maybe reading chapters from your own books is a good way to get readers? I mean, because it's you know, almost parallel to the, the way you started. Yeah, I, I think it's a, I think it's a great idea. We need to make use of the digital opportunities we have now that writers in a different generation never had. I mean, we have more ways to get our words in front of people than than ever before. I, I did the podcast thing because uh, it was kind of before YouTube, even when I started. Uh, but I think YouTube is a great idea. Uh, I think readers, most readers, want to know a little bit about the author. They want to have some sort of a connection with the author. Uh, and a podcast is one way to do it. Uh, reading chapters on YouTube is another because they get to see you, they get to hear you. You probably have a little bit of small talk at the beginning and a, 
bit of talk at the end where they get to know you a little bit as I did in the podcast. So I think that's a, a great idea. Uh, I think for writers, giving it away for free in print form is probably the last thing you should do because ultimately we want the book to be in, in printed form in the hands of readers purchased at an independent bookstore, preferably. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, so that's why we have these other options we can pursue, but I would hold fast to the, to the print version and let that be what, uh, uh, what you charge for because you're, you're, your words are worth something. Excellent, excellent. And and I want to go back to a little bit of the logistics because you talked about the podcast. So I know your podcast opened with some music that you you sourced, made sure that you had the rights right. to use. And then you did a, a brief, in this episode, <laughs> Angus is right. going to whatever. Um, that, that really helped ingratiate yourself with the reader. But then because it was rolled out in a weekly fashion, that also reminded us what, you know, cause, cause it's not right. like you're watching it on Netflix. <laughs> right. Just getting it bang, bang, bang. Yeah, exactly. Well, when I, when I did that, I, I was just picking up something that they used to do in TV all the time where they say in last week's episode, this happened. And <laughs> so I, I, I just thought it was a, uh, it was part of giving the story to the readers is to give them a little bit about, not about me, but just to hear me as, as a person as well. Uh, in fact, some of those early uh, episodes of The Best Laid Plans, and it's still the 2007 podcast that's on iTunes as a free download. You, you'll hear me say if there are any literary agents out there who might be interested. And <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I pitched the novel in a way in some of those uh, some of those episodes. So, uh, but I, I try to get to the reading pretty quickly. It's not a it's not about me. It's about the story. But you do hear me kind of introduce the episodes and say thanks at the end and how they can comment because it you know social media is all about a conversation so they always had a way to get in touch with me whether email leave a comment or on my blog or uh, and you, which is part of it and i remember from those early days because i was a scotch drinker and so was angus and and it was like of wool and scotch and right. i remember a, a <laughs> listener had right. emailed you to say you're pronouncing it wrong dude <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. I think in the first episode, I said Lagavulin, and, and I'm not a drinker at all. So <laughs> I just went to the LCBO, the liquor store here in, in Toronto, and found what was looked like the most exotic and expensive <laughs> scotch. I didn't even buy it. I just took a picture of, of it with my little flip cell phone at the time. And that's the brand I, I gave to Angus as his preferred single malt. But I thought it was pronounced Lagavulin, and then somebody who lives in the uh, highlands of Scotland where they make single malt scotch. He, I'll never forget his email. It was one of the first ones I got. He said, I I'm loving the story. The characters are addictive, but you're mispronouncing Lagavulin. <laughs> and he spelled it out phonetically for me so that I could get it right the next time, which I did. And I thanked him on the next the next. Yeah, I, you, I, I love that because you did interact <laughs> with your readers. Yeah, which of course. Fantastic. Yeah. And of, of course. course, I did. Uh, I was a Macallan drinker myself. Oh. But I went out after finishing the book and said, I've got to buy Lagavulin because if, if Angus is drinking it, it's got to be good. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sure that they've got some sales out of uh, people who had to go check it out, right? Well, maybe one or two bottles, but <laughs> okay, that was just me the first uh, the first few times. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, but you've you've added uh, elements of of yourself into. Sorry, the dogs are going nuts. Someone's coming to the right. door. You've added yeah. elements of <laughs> of uh, yourself into the novel. So Angus designs a hovercraft, which you had done uh, in when you were a younger man. Um, but then the other thing, and this is a, a comment from uh, Edwin, who first uh, pops up, says, thanks for the novels, but then asks a question, because I know it's related to Albatross. Um, it's your affinity for pens. And he asks, what pen are you carrying today? Right. That's a, an excellent question. I have, well, you know what? I have, this is one that I'm, where is it? There we go. Trying to get it in the camera mode. Oh, this is. This is a Visconti Voyager, and it's what I'm, I'm using right now, trying okay. to get it in the center of the screen. Anyway, yeah, I've been a fountain pen fan for, for quite a few years, uh, and I'm, I'm a member in good standing of the Write What You Know School of Writing. So while I am not in the books, and they aren't about me at all, they're, they're not autobiographical, autobiographical really, 
But I do like to write about worlds that I know and have experienced and am interested in because uh, I think it's easier to write with authority and conviction and authenticity if if you do that. Uh, so I, you know, I like to have some eccentricity in my novels. So fountain pens, it's sort of a small subculture, those of us who like fountain pens, but uh, it's a passionate group. And I just thought I would share a little bit about fountain pens in my latest novel. <laughs> so <laughs> it that's was what I did. <laughs> I like that. So thank you, uh, then, Edwin. <laughs> so when uh, when it's something that you obviously have experience with, right? So having worked in Ottawa, uh, fountain pens, writing, hovercrafts, things like that. Not Scotch. You still, you know, that right. was research. So the character in Up and Down, main character in Up and Down. Um, you're not a, a senior female, uh, <laughs> right? How old was she in the? 71, I believe. 71, and have never been into space. Well, yet, have not yet been into space. Maybe, maybe you and Chris Hadfield can go together and sing <laughs> because you're also a musician. But right. uh, <laughs> how did how did you do the research for, for, like, this was NASA, and this is the space program, and this is senior uh, issues. And right. So, well, it, it's and a there's, pilot. Still a, there's still <laughs> a lot of my own life experience in that novel in that the narrator, David Stewart, works at the Toronto office of a multinational PR agency. Oh, I spent man. the first eight years of my career doing that very thing. Uh, and since I was a kid and Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, I have been fascinated by and at times obsessed with space and uh, our, our foray into space. And I still follow that uh, quite uh, religiously. So I thought, what, what would I write about next? Uh, this is one of my third novel was about when I was going to start writing it. And I thought, well, why don't I set it in a PR agency and make NASA the client? Uh, and I wanted to write more about older women, senior women, uh, because I think older women are sadly absent, even neglected from our, our mainstream literature. And writing about Muriel, the Muriel character in my first two novels made me want to write more uh, about older women. And so I cooked up this idea of a, you know, a youngish PR guy who would narrate and a much older woman who wins a lottery to be one of the first two citizen astronauts to take a trip on the space shuttle and spend a week in the uh, in the International Space Station. And all that went into that, and there's politics and a bit of uh, uh, corruption and lots of, lots of fun. So that's where that came from. It was just my interest in space and my experience as a PR agency professional. Uh, it all just came together and the novel kind of wrote itself in a way. Oh, that's fantastic. And uh, so I have to, I have to ask then. So your latest novel, which is you know returning to Angus and Daniel, is uh, assassination. That almost sounds like a thriller, but it's yeah, going it, to be a humorous novel, correct? Yeah, it is. A, it's kind of a fine balance. I mean, it was a. Ch I like to set a challenge for myself with each uh, with each <laughs> novel. Uh, I mean, I'll, many of my novels are quite similar. Uh, if you particularly if you've read them in in quick succession. But there's always something about each one that's a little different. Uh, I mean, when I wrote One Brother Shy, I had never written a narrator who was not just flawed, as my other narrators were, but <laughs> was actually damaged. Yeah. He was damaged and he was recovering from something. And I, I thought, okay, well, trauma. yeah, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. So that could be something I yeah. could uh, I challenge myself to write. Uh, in, in this, this uh, new novel I'm working on, you know, I, I like reading thrillers, but I've never really read a comic thriller, except perhaps for, I mean, Hugh Laurie wrote a funny novel called The Gun Seller, okay. uh, which is pretty good. And Robert Ludlum actually wrote uh, a pretty funny thriller called The Road to Gandolfo, I believe it's called. Oh. Um, and so I, I, I wanted to try... Uh, adding some thriller elements into it. And you probably saw the roots from for that in Albatross. There is a scene in Albatross that is yes. kind of oh my thriller like. And yes, that's where that started. Yeah. I was actually in Oklahoma City 
uh, at the draft digital office. I go there once a quarter. And I, re I was standing in the parking lot at the end of the workday waiting for my Uber to take me back to the hotel when that scene was going down. And I was so disappointed because I didn't want to be rude. I wanted to stop <laughs> listening so I could talk right. to the Uber driver. And I was like, right. oh, I can't wait to get to the hotel so I can finish this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's when I got the idea of maybe writing uh, something in that. I mean, it's not a classic thriller where people are getting beat up and bullets are whizzing by. But there, there are elements of, of a thriller in there and maybe some suspense. And, uh, you know, uh, we'll see how it goes. I mean, never having done it, I don't, I'm not really sure I know what I'm doing, but I've never really known what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> I just do it the way I think it makes sense. And we'll see how the story unfolds. But uh, so far, so good, I hope. Fingers crossed. Well, uh, for somebody who does not know what he's doing, and <laughs> uh, you've, you've done okay. Uh, now, what would you advise to anyone who's uh, watching or listening to this to, uh, are they thinking uh, that they want to write a novel, like just like you had written uh, The Best Laid Plans? Now, what advice would you give to, to people who are, are just getting started? That's a good question, and, uh, and you sort of get this a lot. Maybe, uh, maybe a couple of points. One, a novel feels so daunting. It feels so long. Like it feels like it's such a massive undertaking. Uh, I don't think of it in that way. I, I think of it as a chapter by chapter exercise. I just have to write the next chapter. And my chapters tend to be about 5,000 words in length. Surely we can all write 5,000 words. So we write that chapter and it goes into your computer file and then at some point later, you start chapter two and you write another 5,000 words. And incrementally over time, uh, that computer file has chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, five, six, seven, eight. And you just keep doing that. You just keep scaling that 5,000 word mountain rather than the 100,000 word mountain and you will get there. The second point I might say is that uh, I think it's one of my writerly secrets is the voices of my narrators are very much like my own voice. Uh, again, I'm not in the novel, but I know that voice very well. And I think it's easiest to write authentically and convincingly uh, if you're writing in the voice you know best, and that tends to be your own voice. So you might want to create a character who has a voice that's kind of like yours, uh, that might make it easier for you to write and have it connect with the reader. Uh, if you try to write, write about something you have no idea about or a character who you've never met before or anyone like it, it's hard to get those words on, on the page in a way that the reader will find them convincing, persuasive, believable, credible, all of that. Uh, so yeah, I you know the jokes that the, the funny lines, I hope they're funny at least, that you see in, in the novel, it's the same line I would be using at the dinner table if the same situation came up. So it's it's often my voice, at least the narrator is. Other characters you need to obviously write in different voices, but it's kind of why I write in the first person because it gives me a strong narrative voice all the way through the story. Uh, and it's usually my voice. Excellent. Well, it's a voice I really, really enjoy. Uh, now, speaking of voice, if a, if a writer is considering that they may want to record their own uh, audio book, um, what do you recommend that they first check out or, or be wary of? <laughs> uh, well, it's uh, what I found when I first did the podcast is that I learned the rule that you, when you're editing, you should all, whether you're doing a podcast or not, you should read your words out loud. Uh, I had so many sentences uh, in when I was rec reporting, uh, recording the podcast that when I wrote them, I thought, wow, these are beautiful, pristine, flowing, mellifluous sentence. I love that. <laughs> and then I would read it out loud in the podcast and it would go clunk, clunk, clunk. <laughs> and it's different when it's read out loud. So I think it's a great way to edit and to make your writing better is to, is to read your work out loud, podcast or not. Uh, but I guess the other thing is, uh, maybe just a, a little technical thing. Uh, when I did the first chapter, I would record, and then when I made a mistake, I would turn off the recorder, and then I would restart it and keep reading from there. 
And I quickly discovered that it's much better just to do one long recording uh, rather than ending up in your Audacity screen or GarageBand screen with 18 different tracks with five minutes each. Like that's just crazy. <laughs> so uh, just record the whole thing. If you, me if you mess up, stop, leave a bit of a break and then re repeat that sentence and, uh, and, and carry on. Uh, but I, I thought it was a, a fun, you learn a lot about storytelling when you read it out loud. And I think you become a better writer when you have told your story orally. Because uh, that is, in a way, our brains are hardwired in the oral tradition, I think. Uh, storytelling goes back so far, when we're, when we're little kids, our parents are reading us stories and that gets kind of embedded somehow in our, in our brain wiring. Uh, so read it out loud, and I think you'll become a better writer for doing that. Awesome. Well, Terry, that is fantastic advice uh, to lead off with. People can check you out at terryfollis.com. That's great. F Mark, thanks for having me. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so that's thank right. you so much for, uh, thanks for the inspiration. Thank you for all of the great, uh, great advice for writers, and thanks for writing, and I can't wait to read your next book. Well, Mark, you were there at the very beginning and you inviting me to do a book launch at the McMaster Bookstore was an important part of the my early story as a writer. So I'm grateful for that. So thank you. Nice to be here. All right. And goodbye, everyone. Thanks again, Terry. Stay safe.